Good morning and welcome to New Jersey's first ever Trails and Greenways Summit. I'm Elise Bremer Nye, Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator with the New Jersey Department of Transportation. And I'm Brandy Chapman, State Trails Coordinator with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. We are so happy to be kicking off this milestone event on the first day of fall. The New Jersey Trails and Greenway Summit is a result of countless hours of effort by advocates and public officials around the state who've been working hard to bring this together. We have two days of panel sessions covering a range of topics with plenty of knowledgeable and passionate speakers lined up for you. Yes, and we'd like to thank NJDOT and NJDEP both for co-sponsoring this event. We received the funding to do this and I can hardly believe it managed to put it all together in three months time. Without the support and coordination of both state agencies, none of this would have been possible. We would also of course like to thank our summit planning committee who worked tirelessly to bring this all together in a very short time frame. We hope the success of this summit leads to even more fruitful efforts as we work to build a world-class system of trails and greenways throughout our state. This conference will hopefully serve as an opportunity for all of you to network, share ideas, and deepen your understanding about New Jersey's growing network of safe walking, cycling, and rolling corridors that connect our communities. I don't know why. We oh, hope this summit inspires you to organize in your own communities and work together to improve access to trails and greenways for everyone. Well said, Elise. Summit sessions will take place over the next two days. This morning opens with a keynote session with welcoming remarks from the commissioners at DOT and DEP, representatives from the U.S. Department of Transportation, and a presentation by Camden Communities Part Com excuse me Camden Community Partnerships Mishka Mitchell. Following that, we have three panels rounding out the day. You will hear about New Jersey's regional trail networks, about strategies to secure funding for trails in your own towns, and how to plan more inclusive trails that are accessible to all. Tomorrow, we'll feature three more panels covering DEP's efforts to map the state's trails, a discussion of how we are integrating trails with mass transit and complete streets, and the economic benefits trails can offer to the towns they connect. And finally, we will cap things off with a keynote session featuring closing remarks from Deputy Commissioner Olivia Glenn at DEP and Assistant Commissioner Mike Russo at DOT. We will conclude the summit with a presentation from Amy Camp author of Deciding on Trails, Seven Practices of Healthy Trail Towns. Her presentation entitled Permission to Thrive will touch on new trail towns, regional trail networks, COVID recovery, and it will also provide inspiration for all of us to continue pushing ahead. The past few years have been such a difficult time for so many of us, and they have shown just how important access to green space and active transportation options are. But it has also shown the amount of grit and determination that we New Jerseyans have to face adversity and come back stronger than ever. I am really excited to get started. How about you, Brandy? I couldn't agree more. Let the first ever New Jersey Trails and Greenway Summit begin. Well, then without further ado, we shall start with a welcome from NJDOT Commissioner Diane gutierrez Scacchetti. A native New Jerseyan, the commissioner is a transportational professional with more than 31 years in the industry and 37 years in government service. Her accomplishments and leadership have been recognized by the Executive Women of New Jersey, and she has been named WTS Central Florida Woman of the Year and Orlando Business Journal's 2015 CEO of the Year for the public sector. She received the 2019 Service to the People Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers Central New Jersey branch and the 2020 Women of Achievement Award presented by the New Jersey Chapter of Professional Women in Construction. She has prepared a brief video for us discussing the work that DOT is doing in the realm of trails, greenways, and active transportation. Good morning and welcome to New Jersey's first Trails and Greenways Summit. I am extremely pleased that the Department of Transportation is co-hosting this summit with my good friend Sean LaTourette and the Department of Environmental Protection. Our agencies have been working together for many years on a shared vision of providing resources, funding, and implementing world-class trails and greenways networks across the state. This inaugural summit is the result of that partnership 
and a testament to our ongoing work with state, county, and local governments, as well as advocates dedicated to expanding and improving our pedestrian and bicycling network. Trails and greenways are an essential part of New Jersey's active transportation system. They support our commitment to developing complete streets in communities throughout our state. They also support the department's commitment to communities initiatives, which seek to improve the quality of life for everyone who uses New Jersey's transportation network, regardless of age, ability, and socioeconomic background. How do trails and greenway networks improve the quality of life for New Jerseyans? They promote a healthy lifestyle by providing families the opportunity to spend time together outdoors and allowing young people to walk or bike to and from school with their friends. Trails and greenways attract tourism, which supports local and regional economies. And by promoting walking and bicycling, they improve the environment by contributing to cleaner air and water and reducing the use of fossil fuels. As you may know, I grew up in Mercer County and I've spent many enjoyable afternoons walking the trails with my dog, Mason. I can't stress enough how much I value this asset in my community. Our vision for New Jersey is a statewide network of trails and greenways, not unlike our road system, that combines transportation, conservation, and recreation with equity for all to travel, play, and learn. Over the last decade, the New Jersey Department of Transportation has invested more than $140 million in multi-use trail projects throughout the state. These investments range from the Barnegat Branch Trail in Ocean County to the recent grand opening of the five and a half mile section of the Delaware River Heritage Trail in Burlington County. This is just one of many projects funded through NJDOT local grants. Safe routes to school funds were used to make improvements to on-street bike lanes and off-road paths in Cape May County that provide summer visitors with new travel options that connect popular tourist attractions. In the past decade, $10 million has been invested in the Morris Canal Greenway, another multi-use trail effort that goes through six counties from Warren to Hudson. One of the most exciting projects was the Benjamin Franklin Bridge Walkway project that created a new bike-friendly, ADA-compliant ramp leaking the southeastern Pennsylvania section of the East Coast Greenway with the Camden Greenway in New Jersey. It provides a crucial connection within the Regional Circuit Trails Network and more importantly, people on bikes and pedestrians with disabilities can safely and efficiently cross the bridge between Philadelphia and Camden. The use of trails and greenways has skyrocketed over the past two years and is proof of both the desire and need for robust and expanded trail infrastructure. Now is the perfect moment to channel this interest into a concerted effort to expand and encourage the development of trails and greenways across our state. In Somerset County, Montgomery Township just opened a new state-of-the-art path that provides pedestrians and cyclists access to schools, surrounding neighborhoods, and parks. NJDOT provided a $360,000 municipal aid grant that funded nearly half of this project. It is my hope that this summit will be the start of a tradition that advances the conversation around trails and greenways and increases knowledge about what it takes to create and maintain pedestrian and bicycling networks throughout the state. I am pleased that several sessions of this summit include DOT staff who will share how we can help you advance your goals. A special thank you to Assistant Commissioner Mike Russo, Zenobia Fields, and Elise Bremer-Nye, our Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator, for leading this effort and their teams that made this event so successful. Also, I would like to express my appreciation to all of our committed partners who served on the planning committee. There are too many to name, but know that we appreciate each and every organization's contribution. Finally, I am grateful to all of you who support this vision and are working passionately to make it a reality. Thank you. Wow, what a great overview of the work being done at DOT. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, we'll hear from DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette. Commissioner LaTourette is responsible for formulating statewide environmental policies that protect public health and ensure the quality of New Jersey's air, land, water, and natural and historic resources. Since 2019, he has run DEP's operations and formulated regulatory reforms to advance Governor Murphy's environmental, climate change, and clean energy priorities. He has prioritized environmental justice while facilitating greenhouse gas emission reductions, climate change resilience and adaptation, and natural resource conservation and restoration. 
Born and raised in New Jersey, Commissioner LaTourette has been the recipient of multiple environmental and governance awards and published scholarship on environmental law, natural resource damage, and climate issues. He has been regarded as a consensus builder, especially at the intersection of economic development, energy, and environmental protection. With that said, I'll pass it over to you, Commissioner LaTourette. Thank you for that, Brandy. I, I appreciate the warm introduction and my deep, deep gratitude for your work and, and so many of our colleagues, both at DEP and at DOT for organizing this first ever summit. Uh, I look forward uh, to an opportunity for us to all gather uh, in person at the summit next year. And a special thanks uh, to my, my dear friend, uh, Commissioner uh, Gutierrez Cicchetti. Uh, your partnership means so much uh, to DEP. You know, New Jersey's trails and, and greenways network, it, it lies at the intersection of recreation, and conservation, and transportation. So we're so excited to co-host this event with our friends at DOT uh, and all of our partners in this important space. You know, often we may not think of our trails. Uh, we, we can often uh, take for granted the open spaces and environmental infrastructure that lay before us, uh, but they are so important uh, to many aspects of our daily lives, right? As we learned during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, recreational trails, open space, provide pathways into our natural world, offer a welcome reprieve from the stresses of, of everyday life, and especially so when we were all hunkered down uh, and staying at home to keep our communities and one another safe. And the public's use of recreation, uh, recreational areas, it's skyrocketed, not just in New Jersey, but across the country uh, during COVID-19 lockdowns. We found ways to connect with nature, even when we could not be physically connected with each other. And that's what trails can do, provide that connectivity, bringing us closer to our environment and bringing us closer to one another. And connect our precious open spaces and provide equitable opportunities for New Jersey residents to become immersed in, in nature. And we have the opportunity to build on how we advance the cause of environmental justice and equity through how we enhance our trail networks. They give us access to preserved places and scenic landscapes, minimally disturb the, the natural world. They contribute to the improved health of residents in what is the most densely populated state in the nation. And they provide outdoor classrooms to learn about our natural and cultural world. I cannot tell you how many insightful and humorous conversations I have with my 10 and a half year old twins while we are out on a trail. The DNR is one of our favorites, uh, but it teaches us in ways we may not expect. Improve our economy through tourism, connecting populations to historic sites, and strengthening the connectivity of our neighborhoods to one another. The tra trails can help to build support for conservationist goals, right? Sometimes we don't know uh, if we are not engaged in the work of ensuring equitable transportation like our friends at DOT, if we're not engaged in protecting the environment and our public health like the wonderful people who work at DEP, we might not have a full sense of all of those opportunities that are available to us. But once we do, once we have that sense we are committed to it and we see that. We see a drive post uh, COVID-19 lockdowns for greater investment in natural resource infrastructure, how we maintain our trails, how we enhance our forests, how we connect these assets because they provide such incredible benefits for free, right? When we maintain a trail, when we invest in the resources to market, when we invest in ways to expand access, we preserve the natural environment that protects us from excessive heat from climate change, for example, or from prolific stormwater runoff 
like we saw sweep through this state only two weeks ago, the remnants of Ida. Did you know that there are more than 1,200 miles of official marked trails in New Jersey? maintained by the state as well as county and municipal governments, nonprofits like the New York New Jersey Trail Conference, for example, and private individuals who recognize the value. DEP's Recreational Trails Program has dedicated more than $23 million to more than 1,000 trail construction improvement projects throughout New Jersey for hiking, bicycling, horseback riding, canoeing, kayaking, mountain biking, you name it, it is available. And New Jersey was, was named, thanks to the great work of our friends in Natural Historic Resources, the great work of Brandy Chapman, was named a Trails Day champion by the National American Hiking Society for three consecutive years as a result of the number and variety of trails that, and, and events that we host in, in our state. And, and of course, transportation is a primary contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions in New Jersey, like it is around the country and the world. Right? So there is a need a deep need in the context of our fight to reduce and respond to climate change, to invest in infrastructure that focuses on non-motorized modes of travel, ways to reduce trips, car trips that is, right? and that can have an equitable benefit for everyone if we do it well, and if we pay close, close attention to the areas of our state and the communities within our state that have historically had less access to the environmental benefits that many of us enjoy. And just this summer, my partner in all things positive and I, Olivia Glenn, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Justice and Equity, uh, worked with our Park Service to launch the first ever youth inclusion initiative to bring, children, to bring young people from uh, inner cities to work in our parks over the summer so that they could have a sense of connectivity to a place they may not ordinarily experience in their day-to-day -day lives. And it was eye-opening for them and for us Again, because our environment connects us to one another. This summit, this summit supports DEP's priorities, including managing and promoting our thriving natural resources. It is all the sense in the world for us to be here and be here again and again and again. Helps us to reduce and respond to climate change, like I mentioned, and provides an opportunity to enhance the quality of life for our residents, regardless of income, age, race, ability, our socioeconomic status, where we come from, where we work, how we recreate or learn or who we love, right? The open outdoors are for every one of us and all of us own it, right? Our environmental resources, our natural and historic resources, they don't belong to the government. They don't belong to the governor, to me, or even to the fine DEP and DOT who work so hard every day to protect them. Our natural resources belong to you. And it is only our job to take good care of them for you. And when you advocate for greater investment in natural resource uh, infrastructure, when you advocate for your community to take on the work of developing a trail network, you are enriching the environment for everyone. So to everyone here today for that, for that important work of advocacy, for showing up and taking care of our environment, I thank you. And I wish everyone here an exciting first summit and I will see you again next year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner LaTourette. Our next welcome comes from Robin Hutchison. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety at USDOT. Prior to being appointed to the Biden-Harris administration, Robin was the Director of Public Works for the City of Minneapolis, where she focused on leveraging public right-of-way investments for broader equity, environmental, and economic outcomes. She has served as the Transportation Director for Salt Lake City, Utah, working to improve all modes of transportation. Robin has also been a consultant specializing in transportation and transit and has worked in cities throughout the Western United States, in London, in France, and for the European Union Commission on Sustainability. She believes deeply in collaboration, partnership, and communication, and brings these values into her daily work. She has also served for seven years on the board of directors for the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, most recently serving as its president. 
Greetings. I'm Robin Hutchison, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation. I really wish we could be speaking outside today, somewhere along the Delaware and Raritan Canal Path, but I'm very grateful to join you all the same. Congratulations to the New Jersey Department of Transportation and Environmental Protection. This is a great event, the inaugural Trails and Greenways Summit. The summit is an opportunity for planners, advocates, designers, and communities to share expertise and to discuss how to build out this incredible network of trails and greenways. It's really important for the Department of Transportation too. Our North Star is safety. We know that we can keep people safe by providing trails and greenways for people who walk, bike, and roll. Whether they're on a hike or commuting to work, there are so many reasons to get out and enjoy and experience trails and greenways. Trails and Greenways also support priorities of the department by keeping our communities and our clients clean and by promoting access and equity. From making our communities safer, more sustainable, and more equitable to expanding tourism and access, this network has a remarkable potential to achieve so many goals. We look forward to working with you and with communities around the country to support efforts like this one. Sincerely, thank you so much for the work you're doing to build a better, safer, healthier America. And I hope that you enjoy your time together at the summit. Thanks. Many thanks to Robin. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Christopher Dowis. Christopher is a community planner with the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, DC. He has managed the Recreational Trails Program since 1992, transfer enhancement activities since 2003, safe routes to school since 2005, transportation alternatives since 2012, and has assisted with bicycle and pedestrian activities for almost 30 years. He manages contracts for research, technology development, technical assistance, and training for trail, bike, and pedestrian related activities. Take it away, Christopher. Thank you, Brandy. Uh... I am very happy to be here. And once my presentation comes up, there we are. Um, that is me. Uh, I guess it's about 50 years ago today or so at my Uncle Edgar's farm on, farm on West Crescent Avenue in Ramsey, New Jersey. I think it was the last farm in the state. It had no indoor plumbing or electricity and it's all gone now. Uh, next slide, please. So we've heard already that uh, we have a whole lot of interest in safety, in equity, in climate resilience. And so this is what the U.S. Department of Transportation is talking about now. Safety, climate resilience, equity, economic strength, transformation. And in the next several months, you're going to be hearing a lot about what we call complete streets. And I'm hoping we're going to change that into complete networks. Next slide, please. So how do we have complete networks? These next slides are going to show uh, how we connect communities by integrating transportation and recreation. One isn't better than the other. We can work together. Trails are the pedestrian and bicycle through routes. They're the spines for non-motorized networks and they can link recreation areas. You can even have off-highway vehicle spines in some maybe perhaps some more rural areas. Trails and pedestrian bicycle facilities provide resiliency because they provide emergency evacuation routes, especially when highways and transit systems don't function. I think those of you who remember September 11th, 2001, know that some people had to evacuate as pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so transportation is not either or with recreation. Neither is a lesser value. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, we have bridges. I saw some really cool bridges in the previous presentations. Um, bridges are ways that we connect our communities. Now, none of these bridges are in New Jersey, although the one over the Hudson is quite close. The three at the bottom are useful because one is parallel to Interstate 95. It keeps the ATVs off of Interstate 95 in Maine. The other two bridges at the bottom, they're, on, they're both in Interstate 75. I'll let y'all guess which one is Michigan, which one is in Florida. Let's go to the next slide. So we have, I got some photos of some bridges in New Jersey. 
Um, so you people know how to bridge differences too. And so that's what we're going to do in this summit. We're gonna treat each other with respect. We're going to bridge our differences. We're going to tie together our communities. Next slide, please. And uh, we have some more bridges here. Uh, I hope that you people know where they are. I guess we go from Cape May all the way up to the George Washington Bridge with some of these, some of these bridges. So let's move to the next slide. Um, tunnels and underpasses are also ways to connect communities. Now I'm going to be partial to the one in the upper right because I took that picture, but that allows me if I want to, uh, I can, or some people in my community, that's where they can get to the Metro station. The photo at the bottom left, they stuck through a tunnel underneath. I don't know if that's a road or a railroad, but it was again, a way of reconnecting the community. The one with all the bollards that's under, under Interstate 5 in um, Seattle. It reconnected communities. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, trails can be used for multiple purposes. We have equestrian trails. I believe the second from the left is a trail somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, but rail trails and other shared use paths, they can serve all kinds of various uses. So. Um, we have, again, ways of connecting our communities and the rail trails are really good spines, as I said earlier. Let's go to the next slide. The Federal Highway Administration has a whole lot of resources available to help you with planning, designing, maintaining uh, your facilities and how to measure uh, facilities. So these publications are all available. We want you to use them. It will help tie your communities together and help you all you know, just enjoy being with, you, with each other, both for transportation and recreation purposes. Next slide, please. I'm really proud that we finally got to release our Rails with Trails report. This has been a long time working, and this is a report that talks about the safety that we can get when we have trail facilities near, not necessarily on railroad rights of way, but near railroad rights of way. And uh, they can, again, reconnect communities, but they also get people off of the railroads. Do not get on the railroad tracks. It's not a good place to be and it's not safe. But yes, it's great to have trails that will get you access to the train station, that will get you access to outdoors, uh, safe, healthy activity. Let's go to the next slide. I also want to encourage you, there is a provision in law, and this is still in effect, to allow states to enter into contracts and cooperative agreements with qualified youth service and conservation corps to do various kinds of projects. Both DOT and DEP have the right to enter into contracts and cooperative agreements with these youth corps. They could do trail projects, pedestrian bicycle projects, safe routes to school projects. Um, photo in the middle, is courtesy of the Phillips, um, the Phillipsburg, uh, what are you called? <laughs> the New Jersey Youth Corps of Phillipsburg. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will see that they actually work. These are the, this is New Jersey people, New Jersey Youth Corps people at work doing good for the state. They don't just sit around. So they're making trails great. They're making our communities great. Next slide, please. We have um, lots of resources available at Federal Highway Administration. This presentation is available and um, Brandy and or Elise or uh, the New Jersey people will tell you how this information can be available. With that, I'm really happy to have been able to join you today. Happy trails and uh, let's go and work together for success for transportation and recreation for all. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Christopher. After working with you for the last, what is it, 15, 20 years, I greatly appreciate you helping us to kick off our summit. Now I would like to introduce Joe Myers. In addition to represented urban communities on the New Jersey Trails Council this year, he is the Chief Operating Officer for Camden Community Partnership a private nonprofit or corporation dedicated to the revitalization of Camden City. Over the course of his 22 years of community and economic development experience in Camden, Mr. Myers has supported, participated, managed, 
and or overseen over $80 million of grant funded projects. And I recently found out he's one of my neighbors. <laughs> Welcome, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to the first ever Trails and Greenway Summit. Uh, my name is Joe Myers, and, and it is truly an absolute pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, so I have, I'll say, three roles to kind of talk about. One is just, uh, I'm the, as previously mentioned, the COO for Camden Community Partnership, or formerly Cooper's Ferry Partnership. I'm also a member of the New Jersey Trails Council. Uh, but finally, I will say that uh, I'm also a proud colleague and friend of the summit's keynote speaker, Mishka Mitchell. So a lot of this stuff was already talked about with, with Camden Community Partnership, uh, as was discussed, a, a private nonprofit created in 1984 to work on a holistic, holistic and inclusive approach towards community economic development in Camden City. I don't wanna go much more into kind of some of the stuff we've been doing, but just related to a lot of the work that we're doing today, I think uh, we believe in partnerships. And I think that's one of the themes that you'll hear about today and, and during the course of the summit. And especially as, as we park users, trail users kind of navigate through this pandemic, there are a few things that everyone can agree on. And that's that parks, trails and greenways are extremely important for our health, our well-being, but also for our communities. However, there's a considerable amount of data that shows the persistent inequities in access and quality and programming. And I would suggest one idea or one metric of success to the group is that this culture of collaboration between partners with the public and private sector is critical. And this collaborative approach is fundamental to the, to the work we do at our organization, Can the Community Partnership, but also fundamental to, to what New Jersey Trail Council works on. So, the second hat I wear today is, is a member of the New Jersey Trails Council, and it was established, as most of you are probably aware, established in 1975 to assist with the trails and program and act as an advisory board to both DOT and DEP. The council was formulated to advise uh, or add, give advice related to trails to be designated to the state trail system, the establishment, development, and maintenance of scenic recreation and connecting trails, also potential acquisitions related to trail development, additions, modifications in relation to the trails plan. The council also encourages development of trails statewide, provides a public forum to discuss state trail systems and trail plans, and provided inform information to the state and general public on trail issues of statewide interest. Uh, the third role that I wanted to talk about today is, is my colleague Mishka. It is truly an honor to introduce someone that I've had the absolute pleasure of knowing, working with, and I apologize, I'm gonna date the both of us, but professionally growing up with for more than 20 years. She's an amazing bio that you can see online in the, in the summit program that you can read on your own, but I just wanna highlight a few quick things. First, she has her master's in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania. She returned to the city after where she was born and raised after Penn to start her professional career as an intern and she never left. She continuously volunteers on several nonprofit boards. And over the course of her professional career, she's had many accomplishments, but I just wanna highlight one consistent theme that's very applicable to today. She has always, and even before it was popular or a buzzword and even more so during the pandemic, but she's focused her work on an inclusive community engagement whether she's working on, and these are different parks through the city. So whether she's working on Farnham Park and Parkside, Bonita and Kramer Hill, Johnson Park and Cooper Grant, or the Cooper's Point Waterfront Park in North Camden, she's tirelessly worked with residents and community groups to be meaningful contributors in their community and neighborhood revitalization efforts. And over the past 20 years or so, Mishka has displayed a deep passion for the city because it is her home, her intelligence, her commitment and passion all push myself and all of our colleagues to do more. And I, I've talked a lot about, or a little bit about Mishka professionally and as a colleague, but I do wanna mention one last thing before I formally introduce her. Besides being a super passionate and highly intelligent colleague, she's also an amazing mother to her two great kids. We both had the kids the same age and we frequently talk about stories about schools and sports and Ubering our kids to practices and where the closest Wawa is for a tournament. 
and all those other thankless things that people and parents do for their kids. But I say this because it gives a brief snapshot into the character of Mishka. She's focused on and passionate about Camden, but she's also very setting a great example for giving back and volunteering and showing that example for her two kids. And I think we could all take a page or two out of the chapter of the story of Mishka. And I could probably go on for another hour about her, but let me just say she's an amazing person and I consider myself lucky to know her. So please join me in welcoming Mishka Mitchell. Wow, Joe. Um, that's a, a, thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here for this first New Jersey Trails and Greenway, Greenway Summit. Um, I'd like to first give homage to the peoples of the Lenny Lenape lands, which I am joining you from virtually. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the New Jersey Department of Transportation and New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection for helping to bring us all together today, along with our federal partners who have always been at the table uh, willing to step in and help as we uh, bring trails and greenways all throughout the state of New Jersey. Uh, thanks to Joe for that outstanding uh, introduction. Um, as Joe would say, uh, your reward will be in heaven, um, and you know certainly it's it's a pleasure to be able to spend time with Joe for yes the the last two decades, um, and our colleagues at Camden Community Partnership. And probably the the hardest thing we're dealing with these days is going through a name change. So uh, from Cooper's Ferry Partnership, which many of you may have known us as, um, it's really an honor again to be here. Um, to be able to share a little bit of my story. So you'll hear a little bit more about me and how sort of I became um, what I will say is an accidental environmentalist um, and share with you um, some of our work um, at Camden Community Partnership, our trails, um, our open space, a little bit of suspense and humor um, and um, some of the age old questions. Um, I'm not sure if someone's gonna bring up the PowerPoint presentation. There we go. Um, so, you know, as we go through this story, you'll hear um, again a little bit more about me, um, and we'll hopefully get to the answer to that age old question whether or not the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, this is a beautiful picture from a park I'll talk about later on in the presentation. But for many of you who, who think about Camden, um, you know, certainly one of the things that people know is it's directly across from Philadelphia. And we always joke in our office. The one thing that we have that Philadelphia does not have is a view of Philadelphia. And so this Philadelphia skyline has become, and, and the Ben Franklin Bridge is certainly an iconic symbol of the work that we are doing in Camden and how things have been changing over the years. Next slide. You know, this slide is titled, you're from Camden with a question mark on purpose. Um, I, you heard a little bit about my history and education, no background, and I'll, I'll tell you a story, you know, where are you from is a question that you get a lot, especially when you're in college um, and in all points of your career in your life, where are you from, where do you live, those are the questions that people ask often. And when you're from Camden, you know, sometimes that could be a nerve wracking thing to know that that question is coming. And I remember a very distinct story of being in a classroom setting and talk people talking about where they're from and me saying that I was from Camden and someone asked me why. And usually, it, you know, it comes with, a, you know, either, you know, a turned up face or eye squinting or some other reaction when, you know, people hear that you're from Camden. Um, and so it's something that I've become accustomed to. Um, back then, um, you know, I, Right now, as I think back on that, I wish I would have gone into, uh, you know, a synopsis of how uh, slavery and racism and all of the things that have taken my family from where we were to being in Camden when I was born. Uh, but certainly during that time, I was a lot less eloquent and there were probably some expletives that came out of my mouth instead. Um, but it's a thing that still happens today. Um, and, you know, I put this slide up in, in particular, when you Google the city of Camden, um, sometimes we, I, I show the slide where it shows the images that pop up, but I wanted to show this one because 
you know, Google will give you those suggestions about things that other people are frequently asking about where you're from or whatever you're typing in. And for Camden, you know, the four questions that are up here, it says, people also ask, is it safe to visit Camden? Is Camden, New Jersey a bad city? What is Camden, New Jersey famous for? Is Camden, New Jersey worse than Detroit? So you can imagine how people from the city feel, even when they have the utmost pride, as I do, about where they come from, knowing that they have to answer a question about where they're from and the perceptions that people have of our city. Um, if you haven't been to Camden in a long time, um, it certainly has come a long way from the year that I was born in the city. And there you know, certainly has its challenges, but there are amazing things and amazing people happening in Camden. For those of you who may not be familiar, I'll just you know, shoot through some of the stats, right? We'll break those off. What is Camden like? It's a small city, just about nine square miles with a declining population of just 74,000 people. At its heyday, when all it was a bustling industrial city, it was about 150,000 people. So we are far from that time and it's still slowly declining. But 40% of our population is under the age of 18. And that is a key important statistic, especially when we're thinking about trails and greenways and parks and open spaces. 40% of our population being so young, where are they to do all day? And how can greenways and trails play a part of that solution? It's a population of 41% African-American and 51% of Latinx, with 14% of the population being foreign born. And that's an increasing segment of our population, especially in some communities that are actually growing in the city. And 36 of our percent of our population lives in poverty, poverty with a 27,000 median household income. And that's compared on the statewide level to in the state of New Jersey, um, an annual income of $83,000. So when we think about New Jersey, you know, it's, it's certainly a tale of two states almost. State of New Jersey has one of the poorest cities in the country and some of the wealthiest places in the country. And so we when we think statewide about how trails and greenways and we're thinking about connectivity, how all of these things intersect, that becomes part of the question. How are we making sure that this is equitable? How are we making sure that the demographics of our state and the changes and the incomes and the available resources that communities have, how are we leveling the playing field for those people? But those demographics don't tell the whole picture of Camden. Some of you may also know that it's the home and the birthplace of recorded sound with the RCA Victor, the birthplace of Campbell Soup Company that still calls itself home, but also most recently, um, it's the, the home and the headquarters for American Water, for Subaru, for lots of other companies that have now called Camden home and are part of the renaissance of our great city. What you may not know is sometimes about the geography of, of Camden. Camden is almost an uh, island. It's surrounded on three sides by water with over 15 miles of waterfront property. But most of that is still inaccessible to the public and is a part of our story of how we make trails part of the solution for our community. Next slide. When you're a kid, you don't know anything about the demographics of a place. Um, you know, you're growing up, you know the people you live with in your town, but you, you've never heard of the census when you're 10 years old outside playing. You don't know about the statistics of sort of who lives where. You're just out having a good time living your life but there are clues around you that signify how things are for you. This is the street that I grew up on. Well, this is the, one of the streets I grew up on. We moved a few times. Um, I live with my mother and my younger sister. She's two years younger than me. Um, her birthday is actually tomorrow. So happy birthday to Chantel. And um, we lived on this street. This is Tim Street in the Centerville section of Camden. Now this is a current day picture and I'll tell you, I, I chose this picture for um, a particular reason because it shows both the decline and what's happening in Camden. 
my home stood where that car is now sitting in that lot in between these two houses. When I lived on this block, it was a full block of row homes. Um, there were two in between the gaps of those two homes and there were two additional ones on the other side. And we lived close to the railroad tracks, but it was a full block of row homes. There's no front yards, there's no backyards. We're actually pushed up against some industry, but this was our home. This is where we played. This is where we spent our time. Um, it was really, you know, you know what they say when you think about a city like Camden, it was what you would picture in that row home um, as sort of vibe. And, you know, there wasn't much greenery. There were no, you know, there's no trees on this street now. There were no trees when I was growing up on this street either. Um, the sidewalks were, I think, in better condition, but, you know, probably the only grass that we saw was what was popping up through those cracks in the sidewalks. So where did we play? You know, we played on those sidewalks, we played in the streets. I spent a lot of time, you know, running up and down, playing tag with my sister and my friends, um, singing, you know, we pretended like we were in a girl group right outside our house. You know, we had a great time there, but there was no grass. And so, you know, that begs the question, right? Where we're thinking about, you know, where the grass is greener, the grass is greener where there is some grass. And I knew, and this is sort of one of the first memories that I can think of, that I noticed that things were different for me than other places. And when I was growing up, we didn't really go on vacation much. Um, I lived, you know, uh, um, pretty poor. We didn't go on vacation. We didn't go a lot of places. But the two places that I went often, I had a cousin. Uh, my first cousin lived in Woodstown, New Jersey with her family. For anyone from in that area, you know what Woods sounds like compared to Camden, we call that the country. And I also had family. Uh, my dad's family was from Burlington, North Carolina, uh, which is truly country. And we would visit there for summers to go see my grandmother, some of my other siblings. And so those were the two places that I really went besides Camden. And immediately in those places, you know, I remember, right, that Woodstown, New Jersey, my cousin had a great big backyard, and we would play, and we would roll down the hill, and she had a front yard, and she had a dog that can go out and roam, and we went to North Carolina. I mean, my grandmother's backyard was the size of like a football field, and we would ride a, a riding lawnmower around the backyard, and we would play all types of games, and I remember thinking that these people must be rich because they have grass. These people, these places are so much different from my home that the only thing I knew that was different is that these people must have money. And so for me, grass and open space was a signifier of more income, better resources, um, better opportunities. Certainly, I couldn't articulate that at the age of 10, but I knew it. I knew it instinctively that there was a difference in those places. And so, you know, when you look at the, the comparisons to those places, right, and I go back to the, to the 2000 census, and Camden's poverty rate was 32.8%. In Woodstown, New Jersey, it was 3.5%. In Burlington, North Carolina, it was 5.4%. Now, that didn't mean that my family, my cousin, or my grandmother in either of those places had much money. But for me, that difference between what those places look like really made a difference. And that has impacted my work at Camden Community Partnership and wanting to be able to bring the open space to the city of Camden and to the population um, as much as possible. Next slide. I grew up in Centerville in one of Camden's landlocked neighborhoods. And I talked about Camden's 15 miles of waterfront property. Uh, this is a picture of, that shows the Kramer Hill waterfront. Uh, Kramer Hill has over two miles of waterfront property. And as of right now, it'll change um, in about a month, but right now it's completely inaccessible to the public. I didn't know that Camden had a waterfront until I was in high school. And even if you don't, some of you, right, you may not know it, you know, there were people, we did a planning exercise for this neighborhood, 
and we talked to thousands of residents through community meetings. Um, this was in you know the early you know 2010 2008 time frame, and we talked to many many people. And there were residents who lived in this neighborhood who lived three blocks away from the back channel of the Delaware, the picturesque back channel that looks out onto Petty's Island with great, beautiful views. And they had no idea that they lived anywhere close to any water. It's one of their greatest untapped assets. And it's the same for lots of places like Camden. Next slide. If you're in this Kramer Hill neighborhood and you're on street level, right where that arrow was, this is what you see. You see a wall of trees. You can't see what's on the other side of it. You have no idea that there's water out there. Maybe unless, you know, there were some people who had, you know, ventured out or people who lived in the neighborhood so long that they were here when there was in industry and they knew what was on the other side of those trees. But for many newcomers, they had no idea that they were so close to a picturesque waterway that could help transform their communities. And so what did we do at Canada Community Partnership? You know, Joe talked about how partnership, it's a part of our name. You know, no matter how many times we've changed our name, Partnership has always been a part of it because it's key to what we are. So here's lesson number two about the grass. The grass is greener where there is equitable access to it. In neighborhoods like Kramer Hill and other places in Camden where there's the opportunity for tremendous assets and open space, if the neighborhoods can't get to it, how valuable is it to have grass there? Next slide. And so the community voices spark change for us. Um, resident input has been the cornerstone of my work in Camden. We want to hear from the residents. It's, it's not about what we want or outsiders. We want to talk directly to them, whether it's door to door through surveys or neighborhood meetings. It's making sure we give them the input. And by and large, you know, they continue to tell us that they wanted to be reconnected to their river. They wanted to be reconnected to their waterways to have the value of those places come back. And so the grass is greener when it is watered with voices of the community. When we're thinking about building trails and greenways in our communities, we need to make sure that the residents are at the table and part of the process from the very onset of those discussions. Next slide. And then what you can get from those discussions is a community vision that one, they will take ownership of, that they will believe in, and they will champion as you try to build it. And for North Camden and Kramer Hill, where we, we work very closely with these residents, all of which have beautiful uh, waterfront property that they can't get access to, that's completely inaccessible and cut off from their communities, they wanted that access. They had a community vision for a continuous waterfront park and trail network that could provide them with access to recreation, but also access to opportunity. That this trail network, the Cannon Greenway, would be a part of the Circuit Trails Network. Next slide. The Circuit Trails Network, that's Greater Philadelphia's regional multi-use trail network. Um, it's growing every year and sort of when it's completed, it's supposed to encompass over 800 miles of trail. There's currently 350 miles of that as part of this network series. In Camden, um, you know, there's very small amounts of trail actually built at this time, and we've been building it as we go along, but making sure that we are part of this network, that people have other opportunities to get to employment centers, that they have opportunities to get to recreation, that they have opportunities to get to other things that can connect them to families, to communities. The grass is greener when it's connected to other green grass, which is why when we also often think of trails, we're not thinking of think trails in isolation. We're always talking about trails as a network, about connecting these communities, about bridging these gaps, as it was talked about earlier this morning, about making sure that this process is something that we are accustomed to and making sure that we're 
building um, community together. Next slide. In Camden, we had that vision for that continuous trail network. Um, a lot of that goes through land that's brownfield sites and requires remediation and, and complex structures in order to make them work. But we want to make sure we start these connections now. And so there's always the need in Camden for interim projects, for, for sharrows, for bike lanes, to start building a culture for biking in the city. And so that's where we started. And we started to incorporate bike trails into every infrastructure project that we did as an organization. And the, the partnerships that we develop as making sure this is happening have been tremendous. Working with the municipal partners through the city of Camden, our county partners, Camden County, the state of New Jersey, and our federal partners, as well as other community groups and other environmental organizations that have, are working in Camden hand in hand to make all of these things possible. But it, it makes a difference if you were seeing both of these streets um, 10 years ago, it was a vastly different experience than you are getting today, just in the beautification of these neighborhoods but also in being able to provide this opportunity for the bike trails and active transportation, a way for people to get from one place to the other by a different means. There are lots of people in the city that do not have cars. So bikes really do become a real alternative to, to means for Camden residents. Next slide. But some of these trails, they have big, um, they have big issues <laughs> and they come from really different solutions. So take the Harrison Avenue landfill, for instance. Um, it's an 86 acre landfill that was uh, a municipal run, you know, just where you dump your trash. It was open from 1952 to 1971, but was never closed or capped. And when I say landfill, you may be looking at this picture and saying, where is the landfill? But I'm talking about that green area in the forefront of that picture that looks like a forest because that's what grew up through the trash. And if you were on street level, that's what you thought was there. And you didn't see any water and you didn't see any access. And that was your view, but it was actually a landfill. And through the tremendous partnership with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, the Office of Natural Resource Restoration, um, the city of Camden, Camden Redevelopment Agency, and many, many other partners, a multitude that, you know, I, I can't even list, I, I would forget too many people, um, have brought together to make part of that community vision that we worked so hard to get with the community in 2008 to, to make it a reality. And first with the building of the Salvation Army Croc Center that opened in 2014 on a portion of the landfill but next month, we'll get to celebrate, next slide, the opening of the Kramer Hill Waterfront Park that will feature an amphitheater, an entry plaza, exercise stations, hiking and biking trails, um, a kayak launch, picnic areas, sensory gardens, and most importantly, the first point of access to the water for the Kramer Hill community. This access is game-changing, it's transformative for this community to be able to have this access to this neighborhood, to this community. It'll have breathtaking views of the bridge, of the Philadelphia skyline, of Petty's Island, and it's an ecological asset. It'll provide recreational opportunities, opportunities to connect with nature. It's directly across from a public housing development, from a regional um, multi-use um, center in the Croc Center and really will be a regional asset inside of the city of Camden. Next slide. I think, I feel like we missed two slides. Uh, if we could go back a couple slides. There were slides um, right after the, there we go. The, Next, that slide. Somehow we missed this one, but I wanted to make sure I get this story in here because um, part of, you know, when we're talking about trails and all of the work that we do in Camden, it's always multi-benefit. Multi and a lot of times we're correcting the wrongs of the past. 
Um, the Harrison Avenue landfill is one example of that, of correcting the wrongs of the past, but so is this one. And so this part, if you, the top photo shows what was north of the, the Ben Franklin Bridge, and that was the Riverfront State Prison. It was a prison that opened in 1985 um, among protests from the community for building a prison on this prime waterfront property in the North Camden neighborhood. And, you know, after decades, the community continued to rally for the closure of this prison and its demolition. And what, what took its place is now the Cooper's Point Waterfront Park, which is a tremendous asset that opened in 2017, which provides five acres of open space and a playground, a 0.4 miles of trail for this neighborhood that connects down to the central waterfront and an asset like no other for what should be used in this neighborhood. Correcting the wrong of what was putting this prison in this place in the first place. Things that don't happen in other places often happen in Camden. And these, both the landfill, this prison, when we think about some of the other polluting industries are just one example of the environmental injustice that takes place in the city of Camden. Next slide. And you can go keep going until you get to the, the bike rack slide. And, um, you know, that just says like the, the grass is greener when we get back to that point. The grass is greener where it is environmentally just. And so when we're building trails and greenways in our communities, um, in our new communities or old communities, how can we use those as an opportunity to correct environmental injustices? And how can we make sure that we are not creating more environmental injustice in communities with the work that we're doing? Camden has a history of environmental injustice and the work that we do to lift up the voices of residents, to remediate the brownfield sites and clean up the land and to create this access is about correcting those wrongs and you know, incorporating the community as a part of that. Next slide. The saying, you build it, they will come. Um, that's not really true. Not for us in Camden. And honestly, I actually found out, I actually just found out a few weeks ago what movie that saying actually came from. But the, the saying is, is what it is. They, you build it, they will come. And for a, for a decade or more, uh, Camden Community Partnership, along with the city and county, have been investing in neighborhood parks in Camden. And what we quickly learned is that that saying was not true. You have to understand for Camden, the role that structural racism, the history of Black and Latinx people in open spaces impacts their present use of those spaces. And in neighborhoods where we were building parks, a park that the residents of that neighborhood had purposely stayed away from maybe for decades or more because it was just a place for illicit activity or criminal use, right? It was not a part of their daily routine. They stayed away from that location. So when we go and invest in those places, it doesn't mean that automatically that becomes a part of their new routine again. And that's how we ended up with an, an initiative we call Connect the Lots to activate those vacant and underutilized spaces in order to have intentional activation, one, to show that those spaces were for them. Um, often in, in Camden, when you build something new for a neighborhood who hasn't had that, they may not think that, that we built it for them when we have. And so trying to make sure that these multi-beneficial projects are used by the community in the way that we want them to. And bringing these kind of initiatives has helped to be able to keep that place for um, that activity. Next slide. Creating that community vibrancy, creating opportunities for community connection. So whether we're doing fitness classes or movie nights, providing access to resources, by having community organizations come and give out things at these events. It's all about creating that vibrancy and community, but it's also about fun. 
And, you know, one thing for me, when I think about growing up in places like Camden and in Camden, some people hold the opinion that people with limited income shouldn't have fun, that they shouldn't spend their money on fun and they shouldn't be out there doing other things. But what life makes life enjoyable is the opportunity to have fun. What makes your neighborhood enjoyable? The opportunity to have fun. And so bringing that simple thing of bringing joy back to the neighborhood is something that we aim to do with the Connect A Lots initiative. Next slide. We provide opportunities for people to explore the city um, through our Explore series, whether they're walking or paddling on the river or biking. And this is from this year's, even in the middle of the pandemic, we had 100 bicyclists join us this year for I Bike Camden and take a tour of some of our art um, sites this year, um, bringing residents and visitors in and promoting healthy lifestyles for our neighbors. Next slide. Our trails and greenways also provide the opportunity for arts and culture. This sculpture called Mechan 11 is a part of a project called A New View Camden um, that helps to also bring, raise awareness around the social issue of illegal dumping for Camden. This is located right along the State Street pedestrian bridge and was part of our route for I Bike Camden. But it also is about changing perceptions of the city. How do we get people to not think of what that Google slide said about Camden? but to visit the city and actually see the vibrancy, to see the change, to see the beauty of what's happening in the city. You know, the grass is greener when it adds to community vibrancy. Next slide. So I'll leave you with those points that I put out those last couple of gems. And this is the uh, art installation called Turntable that's at uh, Cooper's Point Waterfront Park. Uh, it has masks inside of a dome. Um, really uh, notating the sort of the disposable nature of what's happening with COVID-19. Um, but, you know, the grass is greener where there is grass, where it's watered with community voices, when it's connected, where it's environmentally just, and where it adds to community vibrancy. We've helped to lay the foundation in Camden, and we have much work to do. We hope that all of you could be a part of the change for us and in your own communities to help make these opportunities available. Developing strong open spaces that encourage creativity and encourage people to come outside. To create affordable, safe, and creative spaces. To foster connectivity to the region and to other communities and challenge the neg negative perceptions that you may have of other places or other places may have of your community. Leverage the assets in your community, whether it's the river, whether it's an institution, you leverage those assets to provide equitable access to residents in all phases of the work. And where you can balance the community and the ecological needs together in order to make this happen. So I, I thank you all for allowing me to speak with you this morning. Um, I, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of this network of people that are committed to building trails and greenways and open space in, in communities in New Jersey. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mishka. So I know you and I say a lot about this, like life is about stories and you truly have a great story. So on behalf of a lot of people that are coming in the chat, just Thank you for sharing your story. So the, the hard job I have now is that we have a hard stop, but I do wanna squeeze in maybe one question, Mishka, if, if time permits. Um, can you talk for about 30 seconds? I think that's what we have about gentrification and, and how you can kind of avoid gentrification when building some new trails in the communities. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's actually uh, just on point, I've been thinking about this recently. I am a part of a a Camden, New Jersey roundtable sort of discussion group on Facebook. And recently they've been talking about gentrification. And one person commented, the first, when you know gentrification is coming, as soon as you see a bike lane. And I was like, wow, that is something. But people do have that feeling. Not everyone, but some people do. 
Um, one thing I'll say is that trails aren't inherently the signifier of gentrification and they don't automatically lead to that. Um, it's more about the policies and the frameworks that are built around those trails. Yes, we do know that there is literature out there that trails do increase um, the property values around those areas and things like that. But how do we make sure that our communities in our housing policies, in our community endeavors, are making sure that we are uh, creating opportunities for existing residents to stay in place? And so I really think that that starts with the housing policies in your communities, um, how uh, rent stabilization programs are put in place, how tax programs are put in place to make sure that as those property values increase, that we are putting in the safeguards that will be necessary for the existing residents. The residents want the trails. The residents want to see their communities improve but they don't want to have to leave those communities as a result. So working with the residents first and foremost, as always, um, I think that there are solutions that every community can come up with to help to make sure that you can get the best of both worlds when you're building trails for your neighbors. Thank you, Mishka. So I believe that is all the time that we have. So again, thank you, Mishka. Amazing story, as always. Thank you all. Wow. <laughs> wow. We are out of time right now, but thank you for your questions and a big thank you to our commissioners, to Secretary Hutchison, Christopher Dowis, Joe Myers, and our keynote, Mishka Mitchell. I learned a lot about the circuit trails and the connections being made in Camden. I can't wait to visit again and see all the changes taking place. As a reminder to everybody, all the sessions are being recorded and will be available post-summit on the njtrailsaction.org website. When this session ends, you will be prompted to provide feedback in a short survey. We appreciate you taking the time to fill it out and we look forward to your responses, especially regarding the topics you would like to hear more about because there's just too much to cram into one small summit. We encourage you to do some networking on the conference website in your spare time, get to know a little bit about the speakers and their session topics. Yes, please take a moment to do some networking. And I'd also like to extend a thank you to our opening speakers. What an enlightening keynote from Mishka Mitchell. And I also wanna congratulate Upstream Alliance for their recent 500,000 federal grant award from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to make the Camden Water Trail a reality. I hope you can join me for our next session, which is Making Connections, Exploring New Jersey's Regional Trails, starting at 11.30 a.m. Please don't forget to join the New Jersey Trails Action Network and sign up for some of the post-event activities, including locally sponsored walks and rides on trails across the state. Post-summit event information and registration for the New Jersey Trails Action Network can all be found at the njtrailsaction.org website. With that being said, I hope to see you all on the trail. See you at 1130.